There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence here. Now I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of love. When my heart becomes free. Shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. And Holy Spirit, you are. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. And I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your prayer. So let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory. The glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Oh, Holy Spirit, you Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord.
Thank you for watching our service, and thank you, Ethan and Rachel, for doing wonderful music always. And uh, I'm actually coming to you right now from my backyard, and I recorded this Friday because I wanted to touch base with you. Uh, the message I'm going to be teaching is from something that we actually recorded before Jane and I went out of town, and it's just a little standalone thing on attitude, and I think it's going to be very helpful. I read Seth Godin this morning and he was talking about how attitude is not a soft skill. It's still one of the most important skills anyone can ever develop. And in these difficult times, having a great attitude is still so important. So I'm excited about the talk, but I wanted to come to you close to Sunday to be able to fill you in on what all is going on. Uh, we have some cool things that are planned and we'd love for you to be a part of it if you can. Uh, we are dying to see you. Uh, we so want to uh, hug you, but we know we won't do that, but we just want to see you. So here's some things that are going on. Fill you in and maybe you can participate. Wednesday, this next Wednesday, October the 14th, we have some dear, wonderful friends in the progressive Christian movement who have a big bus and are going all over the country talking about vote the common good. Vote the common good. The whole premise is as Christians, it is not about just what is best for my tax bracket when I vote. I ought to be thinking about the marginalized, I ought to be thinking about the poor, I ought to be thinking about the minority, I ought to be thinking about all of those people, and I ought to be trying to figure out who is best for them. It's gonna be from 5.30 to seven o'clock. They've asked if they can use our church parking lot. We said, absolutely. We love these guys, 5.30 to seven o'clock. They'll be in front of the Hateville mural and again, it'll be very political. And so if you can come and you want to be a part, then we would love to have you there just to say hello. It will be a blast to see you. I think Jake is going to be there with ice cream and maybe with his award-winning lemonade. So it should be fun. So that'll be com coming up October 14th, this coming Wednesday. Thursday, if you want to help Jane with Safe House, show up at the church, 345 in the new kitchen. That's that space that's on the main road on Dogwood Drive. 345 and you'll help plate the food that will be taken to Safe House. It takes about an hour, 345, no later than five o'clock, you'll be done. She would love to have the help. It'll be a great fellowship time. Make sure to wear the mask as well. Wednesday, if you come to the church, make sure to wear the mask. One other thing, the last Sunday of the month, I think it's the 28th, I'm really wanting us to do a picnic. And so I'm just curious if you are interested. And if so, there's a great park in Hapeville, downtown Hapeville, We'll send you more details. We'll put it together and make it as fun and wonderful as it can be with masks and social distancing and all that stuff. So again, let us know just uh, right under this uh, video. Just say, hey, yeah, count us in on the picnic. I'm also gonna be sending out to everyone uh, either an email or a text over the next few days. So just let me know. Yes, count us in, we'd love to be a part. Now. Uh, before Ethan and Rachel do another song and before the message on attitude that we all need to hear, uh, let me just remind you, your contributions are what keep us going. And without it, then uh, I guess I could do this from my backyard, but we wouldn't have the building that we are preparing. Even now, we are preparing for the day that we will roll back in and it's going to be so wonderful. So your contributions make a difference. It couldn't be done without you. Uh, some of you carry a huge weight when it comes to supporting our church, and I just want to say thank you. Others, you're able to give, and that means the world to us. So thank you for what you're doing. Uh, the three ways that you can give, one is to text the word GIVE to 404-998-8979. They'll send you back a, re a reply. You fill out some information. It's easy to do. Some people have made it a, a recurring gift, so they say, hey, you know, I like to give $50 a week. And they just make it where it happens, $50 a week, or I like to get $50 a month. They just set it up so it just happens, and they don't have to do it anymore. But if you're just doing a one-time gift, this is still a beautiful way to do it. Second way, you can go online to the Village 
atlanta.com slash give. Same thing, put some information in, set it up as a recurring gift if you'd like, do a one-time gift if you'd like. That's beautiful, it's very helpful. And then finally, you can of course write a check to the Village Church, you can put it in an envelope, you can put a stamp on the envelope, you can send it to 3418 Dogwood Drive in Hateville, Georgia 30354. Thank you for supporting. We miss you. Jane and I were on this long trip across country. Every day we talked about how much we miss you, love you, and cannot wait till we can be with you. By the way, I'm wearing the hat. I've had some skin issues on my head, so the doctor said I gotta wear the hat when I'm in the sun. So kind of Sean Connery looking, I think. I know, not really. Let me pray for you. God, thank you for everybody who's watching. Thank you for our church. Thank you for working in our hearts even now. We love you. We ask your blessings on every person. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Well, hello everybody. Thanks for tuning in. This is the Village Church. We actually have a physical location right here in South Atlanta in Hapeville, Georgia. We also are part of Everybody Church and Everybody Church has people watching all over the United States and actually some people even watch from around the world. And so we are honored that you would tune in. Everybody Church also comes on Sunday nights and then you can watch it anytime you want. But uh, there's a, you can watch it on the Village page on Facebook or the Village page on YouTube, or there's an Everybody Church page on Facebook and an Everybody Church page on YouTube. So anyway, we're glad, however you found us, we are super glad that you have. And the people are asking, um, are we closer to knowing when we're going to come back to church? And uh, I, I wish I could say yes, absolutely, but we are still waiting for, for information. Uh, I think we're closer than we were but I can't tell you that it's going to be in the next weeks. Um, just we're, we're trying to pay attention as best we can. So thank you for being a part of this online gathering. And when we do reopen, um, I hope you will be excited about it. And I hope many of you who have become friends through watching online, I hope you can come and actually experience the space with us and experience kind of the face-to-face, heart-to-heart um, handshakes, and I hope one day hugs. 
Uh, we'd love that very, very much. So anyway, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being a part of our service this morning. It means the world to me. I don't know about you, but through this pandemic, there have been some times that my attitude has kind of sucked. You know what I mean? Everybody said, everybody knows exactly what I'm talking about. I, I have just kind of been a grump, been a little bit foul in my attitude, and uh, I don't want to ever ignore that. And so I thought it might be helpful to talk about attitude because if you're like me, and I think most of you are, sometimes our attitude kind of sinks and sometimes it hurts us. And I thought it might be wise to spend some time talking about attitude. It has been said, and it's true, your attitude can make you or break you. It can heal or hurt you. It can help you make friends or it can help you make enemies. It can make you happy or it can make you miserable. It can help you become a success or it can lead to you feeling like a failure. My good friend and partner, Neil, used to go to a Sunday school class taught by Zig Ziglar. That just blows my mind. But Zig Ziglar used to be one of the great uh, corporate coaches in America. And Ziglar used to say this, your attitude, not your aptitude, will determine your altitude. Now, maybe that sounds corny to you, but it's not corny. It's quite true. So let me say it again. Your attitude, not your aptitude, will often determine your altitude. So I just wanted to spend a few minutes with you today kind of helping review a little bit on the subject of your attitude and my attitude because I think we need to look at this from time to time to make sure we're doing our best. Let me give you three facts today about attitude. First fact is this, your attitude reveals a lot about you. My attitude reveals a lot about me. I remember doing a youth sermon years ago. So I haven't done youth, I haven't led the youth in our church in 20 years maybe. So it was a long time ago, I have all these teenagers in a room, and I took a jar of water, and I just shook the jar of water vigorously until water was actually coming out just everywhere. And then I remember asking the teenagers, why did the water spill out? And they would answer different things. That's your lid. The lid is loose on there. So yeah, that's true. That's not the big reason. Why is water coming out? Well, it's because you're shaking the jar. Well, yeah, that's good. That's good. That's not what I'm looking for. Uh, it, gravity, that, that's got to be it. Well, yeah, that's close. But the reason water came out of the jar is because the jar was filled with Water, what was in the jar, is what was coming outside of the jar. And I want to kind of help make that picture for us. What is in us often comes out of us when our attitude kind of reveals what we don't want to believe about ourselves. I wrote a blog several years ago about this idea. Uh, let me read it to you now. I titled it, What's Popping Out of You? Do you remember playing with the jack-in-the-box? When I was a kid, it was the go-to gift to give toddlers. You would get the young child to turn the handle on the box and music would play all around the mulberry bush. And then when they least expected it, the box would burst open and a clown or a jester would pop out. Then the child would either squeal with delight or cry hysterically. You've probably seen that. This morning, I was thinking about how our life is a little bit like the jack-in-the-box. You and I are pretty good at keeping our inner lives hidden. We know how to put on a great face in almost every situation, but there are times that affect us much like the turning of the crank on the jack-in-the-box, and often to our great surprise when we least expect it, out jumps an attitude that seems foreign to us, at least outwardly. Where did that come from? That's not me. I I'm not that way. That was an apparition. 
Long, long ago, maybe a couple of millennia, millennia ago, a wise teacher, this is Jesus, by the way, he said it like this, the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. In other words, what is in us is what comes out of us when we're stressed. I find this truth to be sobering. The sharp word I said to my wife, that was in me. The angry word that I spoke to my grandson, yep, that came from way down inside of me. That time I cursed under my breath when the older driver didn't accelerate through the yellow light, but slowed down and stopped, forcing me to slam on my brakes, that came from deep inside of me. That's why it's unhealthy to ignore our interior life. I continued, we like painting the outside of the house for everybody to see. It's far better to work on the foundation and the structure of the house, which is not easily seen, but is much more important. When something really ugly comes out of you, don't ignore it. Don't try to explain it away. The nastiness comes out because it is in you. Own it and then set out to change it. As you grow and mature in life, your response to stress needs to reflect the deeper, more thoughtful person you're becoming. Get rid of the ugly anger lying deep inside of you. Watch what you say. Remember, it really does reveal the health of your heart. Do the tough interior work. You and those closest to you will be so glad you did. So, what is in us is revealed, and so when you think about attitude, don't just write it off and say that was just a moment in time, not a big deal. No, when we blow up and we act a fool, it's because something is broken in us. Something is not working. Something is a little disconnected. Something needs our attention, so don't ignore it. That's fact number one. Your attitude reveals you. My attitude reveals me. Here's the second thing. My attitude determines to a large degree the success and failure of every relationship in my life. What a difference your attitude can make. Your attitude affects every relationship. And sometimes relationships won't even get started and they could have been good relationships, but your attitude is pushing people away. And you have to be careful of that. I don't agree with everything John Maxwell teaches or believes, but he says some wise things. He's an author in his book, 12 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. He says this, attitude isn't everything, but it is the main thing that affects everything. Let me say that again. He says, attitude isn't everything, but it is the main thing that affects everything. The power of attitude is that everything of real value to you starts with attitude. The author John Homer Miller once said this, your living is determined not so much by what life brings you as by the attitude you bring to life. It really has that much power. In Numbers chapter 12, we don't talk a lot about the book of Numbers in the Old Testament, but in the book of Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 through 11, we read a story about two brothers and a sister. One brother is Moses, and he has a really good attitude. The Bible says this, and by the way, I think this is funny. Let me just do this as a parenthetical thought. Um, kind of the traditional belief is Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, all right? Um, I don't believe that, and I don't think any, I don't think people who seriously study the Bible believe that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, but it's attributed to Moses. Here's one of the reasons I don't think he wrote it. In verse three, it says this, Moses was a humble man, more humble than anyone on the face of the earth. So I'm thinking, in, if I ever write my next book, I'm going to say that Ray was a humble man. Ray was more humble than anybody else on the whole face of the earth. Yeah, I think that probably comes from somebody else's pen, don't you? I, I think it probably did. But anyway, when it says that, he was a humble man, more humble than anyone on the earth, I think the idea is he was a, he was a, he was a good attitude guy. He was somebody who could work with people. He was cooperative. He had had a teachable spirit. 
He was able to lead people because he himself had been led. But Moses' brother Aaron and Moses' sister Miriam, on the other hand, they hadn't arrived there yet. Their bad attitude eventually spills out. Miriam seems to have had the worst attitude, and she infected her brother Aaron. In verse 1 of Numbers chapter 12, we read this. Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife. Someone who came from a different region, someone who had a different skin complexion, and they said bad things about their brother because of this Cushite wife. Do you get the picture? Here they are, family members who Moses thought he could count on and trust, but they actually are stirring up dissension behind his back, criticizing him, stirring up trouble against their own brother. You can never trust people with bad attitudes because they'll do things you never thought they'd do. And, and it's not anything about the Cushite wife. That's not it. It's in them to just kind of let the ugly out and they just look for reasons they can latch on to to just do it. It wasn't, a, uh, it wasn't anything except something really ugly in them. It was the shaking of the jar. What was in them was going to come out, and it certainly came out in that bad attitude. Oftentimes the things we criticize in other people and we get stirred all up about, they're not really the problem. The problem is there's something sour in us. There's something that's off base in us. And so when that vessel gets shaken, it comes out, even though what we say maybe doesn't have anything to do with what the real issue is. Here's the third fact about attitude. This is the one I want you to really zone in on. Your attitude is always your choice. And my attitude, I have to believe this, is always my choice. If I don't say it like that, then I give myself excuses and I can say, yeah, not my fault. I, they were mean to me at work today or somebody cut me off on the highway or somebody did this or somebody did that or I didn't get the promotion I thought I was going to get. So it's not my fault. No, your attitude is you and my attitude is me. <clears throat> you can't choose what's going to happen to you today but you can choose your own attitude. We each have the power to decide how we are going to respond to things that happen to us. I, I guess preachers for the last 70 years have all used Viktor Frankl as kind of the go-to when they're talking about this. He stood under the glaring lights of the Gestapo court in a Nazi concentration camp. Soldiers had taken away from Victor every earthly possession. They had taken his clothes. They had taken his watch. They had even taken his wedding ring. And as Victor Frankl, Dr. Victor Frankl stood there naked, his body shaved before those cruel men, men who tried to take every ounce of dignity from him. At that moment, Frankl said he realized he was destitute except for one thing, he still had something that no one could take from him, not even the Nazis. He still had the power to choose his own attitude. And he chose to not give that attitude to his enemies. He chose joy. He chose hope. He chose being positive. And he was not going to let them take that from him. Maybe right now you're listening to me and you're feeling broken. Maybe your life has taken too many turns to, for the worst and it's really beating you up. A lot of things maybe have gone wrong for you and it seems like everything has fallen down right on top of you and you're weary, overwhelmed, and your hopes and dreams are fading fast over the distant horizon. I know a little bit about what that feels like. And it's tough. I'm not going to say it's not tough. But in such times, we can remember that there is something that our situation cannot take away from us. There's something that not even Nazis, not even disease, 
not even cerebral palsy or paralysis or even facing someone leaving us that meant the world to us, nothing like that can take it away. And that's the power that we have to choose our own attitude. No matter what has happened to you, and I know many of you have had tough times, you've had relationship nightmares, you've had health issues, you've had financial burdens, and certainly during this pandemic, those things are magnified. I get it. But you still have a choice. And I have a choice. And we don't have to give that away. We can hang on to that choice. That's why when even life is crappy, I can still choose that I'm going to hold my head up, I'm going to be hopeful, and I'm going to be kind. And I'm not going to let my mouth come out with all the stuff that maybe if I was not controlling my attitude, would come out because I want to control my attitude. Your attitude reveals the real you. It determines the success of your relationships, and your attitude is your choice. I know I was raised a little bit weird. Um, even though we were a sports-oriented family, and we very much, uh, my dad, who was a computer guy, he also liked American poetry. He loved, so when we would go on trips, he would teach me poems. And I remember him teaching me a poem by Robert Louis Stevenson. And I remember him telling me that Robert Louis Stevenson had been a very sickly little boy. And this poem was about him being a sick child. It's called The Land of Counterpain. And for those who maybe don't recognize the term counterpain, that's a word for a bedspread. And it's a story, Robert Louis Stevenson, a poem he wrote about being this sickly little boy who played with his little soldiers and little toys while he was sick in the bed and couldn't get out, couldn't visit with anybody, couldn't do any of the fun things. He was able to make the best of his situation just playing on top of the bedspread. So I, I just wanted to read this to you. I, I know the first stanza by heart, but I have long forgotten the whole poem. This is Robert Louis Stevenson. When I was sick and lay abed, I had two pillows at my head, and all my toys beside me lay to keep me happy all the day. And sometimes for an hour or so, I watched my leaden soldiers go with different uniforms and drills among the bedclothes and through the hills, and sometimes sent my ships and fleets all up and down among the sheets, or brought my trees and houses out and planted cities all about. I was the giant, great and still, that sits upon the pillow hill and sees before him dale and plain the pleasant land of counterpain. And I remember my dad just driving the point home to me. That was a little boy that was sick, but he had decided he was going to see it through different eyes and he was going to protect and keep a good attitude. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Let me tell you a couple of things that help me. When I do this well, these are some things that I try to remember. One thing, I try to speak positive words. Um, and this is something that is a learned behavior, and it is something that I can easily drift from, and it's something that I have to kind of drift back into, or not drift back into, decide I'm going to get back into, and that's speaking positive words. Speaking positively is something you can learn by practice. It doesn't come naturally to many, especially if you grew up in a real negative home. And uh, many of my friends have told me, Ray, you can't imagine what home life was like for me. Um, I think it's easier sometimes to talk negatively, to be critical. And uh, most of us can just fall into that without even thinking about it. But I want to be someone who speaks positively. Uh, you may write, want to write this down. Uh, this is helpful to me. I believe we create the atmosphere around us by the words that we speak. I believe when I speak beautiful, loving, hopeful words, I believe I find myself walking in a beautiful, hopeful, positive atmosphere. And when I speak critical, negative, damning words... I find myself walking in a critical, negative, damning atmosphere. Does that make sense? 
I really think there's power in our words. Therefore, the task of the beautiful life is to try to eliminate that negative talk, especially when it's, when it's about other people. Listen, some of us are putting stuff in our brains and then we are spewing it out and it is just negative, negative, negative stuff. And uh, I, for me, I don't want that to be my life. I'm on this earth for a little while and I would rather create a beautiful environment to live my life and I find that happens often with my words. Here's step two. No matter what happens, look for the good. Try to find something good in a situation. Now, I, I know that we all are different by personality. And I know that I have a more optimistic personality by nature. In other words, I didn't have to work on this optimistic personality. Um, Jane talks about me being the little boy um, who always tries to find the best in everything. And there's a story that illustrates that. A little boy was just so optimistic and his family was worried about him because they said, this is, he's not even close to reality. And so they said, we're going to teach him something that's going to help him. And so they gave him for his birthday a room filled with horse manure. Crazy, I know, but the room's full of horse manure. And so they say to him, son, your present is in the room and he walked in the room and suddenly he is in horse manure and he just is smiling and just going like crazy and they said what what, what are you doing you, you seem happy and he says I just know if there's this much horse manure there's got to be a pony in here somewhere my wife says you're the boy with the pony Ray that's you you're gonna always be that kid with a pony looking for the pony and maybe I, that is me but you know what I want to be that rather than be the person who's always, do you remember Gulliver's Travels? When I was a kid, there was a cartoon, Gulliver's Travels. And there was this one guy that was always a part of the group that was always saying, we're doomed, we're doomed, we're doomed. We're never going to get out of this. We're doomed, we're doomed. I would rather be the guy that's always trying to find something good in the midst of every situation. I think that if you really look, if you really look, you can find it. Somewhere you can find it. Do you remember when Moses sent 12 spies to spy out the promised land and they came back and 10 of the spies said, here's the report. There's no way we can go into the promised land because there are giants there. There are military forces there. They will kill us. Sure, the land is pretty, but we're not going to be able to win. We're going to get our clock cleaned. We cannot go there. And only two spies came back and said, it's the most beautiful land you have ever seen. It is indeed a land filled with milk and honey. Yeah, there's some military issues we're going to have to address. But guys, this is everything God said it was going to be. What were they doing? They were putting their emphasis on that. They were finding the good. And I believe we can do that as well. We need to stop nitpicking. We need to stop being so negative. We need to stop that destructive cycle that so many, and, and I'll tell you, it, if you could be in our private life, mine and Jane's private life, there are times when I will say, okay, can I just let you know something? I feel like over the last few days, I have just been negative, just kind of an ass. I don't know why. I don't know where it's come from, but I don't like it, and I'm taking steps to address it. So I just want you to know, thank you for being patient with me, but I don't like being that guy. And she's always just said, oh, yeah, you have been an ass. Not really, but anyway, she, usually she does kind of say, yeah, I get it. But she, uh, she knows I'm trying to work through it. I want to be a more positive person. Third thing I want to say is this. It helps me to really take charge of my thought life. And by that I mean I am capable of kind of just being in neutral and just letting whatever comes my way come my way. But I also can put my life in drive where I am determining what I'm putting in. And I can read things that build me up and help me and educate me and make my brain feel like it's growing 
and make me feel stronger about life and about what I know and about what life can hold and how I can be better as a husband and how I can be better as a pastor and how I can be better as a leader. I can read those things. I can meditate on things from a spiritual uh, direction from the Bible or from wonderful books that have been written by wonderful people who have insights that are helpful that will help me understand God's love for me, that will help me overcome shame and guilt, which is something that I have struggled with in my life. I can actually put my life in drive and I can be filling my life with those kind of thoughts or I can put it in neutral and just let whatever comes my way And I'll be honest with you, many of you are Facebook people, I'll be honest with you, we put so much stuff in our minds that is, especially as it relates to politics, that I will find myself getting so frustrated and even angry at people who post stuff that I just don't believe. I just don't believe. They say stuff and I think, that's the dumbest thing I have ever said. I cannot believe that person believes that. And I have discovered that if when I put that in my mind, it ends up just kind of throwing me off for the whole day. So it's better not to put that stuff in my mind. I would rather just love them. I don't want to look at that kind of stuff. I don't want to see it. Um, I, if I go to Facebook, I want to see you have pictures of your kids and pictures of something fun that you've done. I don't want to hear how your politics. That's not something I really give a rip about. And it can get me in a foul mood sometimes. And so I have to really guard that. I want to uh, replace those kind of negative things with good, positive things. I love watching movies that open me up to a bigger understanding of love, a broader understanding of life. I love that. And the last thing I want to do is watch a movie that causes my heart to shrink or feel less than. And there's sometimes I watch a sad movie, but it's sad in a good way. It's, it's, it's grief that is a good grief. It's a cleansing, purifying grief. But I want to make sure that I'm putting into me those kind of things. I think that, for me, is most helpful. All right, that's enough. I hope you'll do an attitude check. If you have a best friend or a partner... I hope you'll say, hey, can we just talk about attitude, how we're doing? Um, and, and mainly, don't try to tell them how their attitude's doing. You kind of talk about how you can do better in yours and let them talk about how they can do better in theirs. And let's be people that really have beautiful attitudes. Craziest thing in the world to me is somebody who says they're followers of Jesus and then nobody wants to be around them because their attitude is so um, awful. As followers of Jesus... Our attitude should be getting better, warmer, more loving, kinder, embracing in every way this life in a bigger way than we ever thought possible. Well, thank you for hanging with me. I love you very, very much. I can't wait till we can get together. I hope it's not going to be too much longer. I really miss seeing you face to face and I can't wait till we can be back here. Don't forget, follow Everybody Church. They'll have a service coming on tonight. A conversation started with Stan. And then just keep those two things going. Watch the village. Watch everybody church. Watch the village. Watch everybody church. And uh, let us be your church home. We, We appreciate that very, very much. Love you. Take care.